Wisdom of the Field webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us today for our Claiming Epiphany webinar. Um, I am so excited that everyone can join us virtually to join us here in the Center for the Ministry of Teaching at Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, my name is Sarah Stone Cipher, and I am the digital missionary here at the CMT. I am your humble host, and I am joined by my wonderful colleagues in ministry. I have Matthew Kozlowski, who is one of our Building Faith co-editors, Charlotte Han Greeson, who is our Building Faith co-editor as well, and she's located over in California. And then we also have CMT instructor and curriculum guru, Dorothy Lithicum. So we are here. Um, and we are using Zoom as you all have successfully logged in. Um, so you will be able to see and hear us, hopefully. Um, and we will be able to see your comments over in the chat box. So if you have any questions or if we're not speaking loud enough or if you um, you know, need to make a declarative statement about Epiphany, which is totally might be the case, you can go ahead and leave us a chat message over on the right hand side. And again, I'm loving seeing everybody um, as they're coming in. So Nancy, Pam, Kristen, Barbara, Jana. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so um, we wanted to make sure that you know that this recording will be made available um, to you all afterwards. It'll be up on YouTube. So if you realize that this would be the perfect thing for your um, formation committee to look at, it will be made available about 48 hours after, um, after this recording. So, um, so any other sort of first time things that I left out, guys? <laughs> Always a possibility. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and, um, and gather in prayer. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that way you can see our, our prayers. And then we'll also be reading the Epiphany story as well. Let us pray. Oh God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only son to the peoples of the earth. Lead us, who now know you by faith, to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as our sort of gathering point, I'm, we're just going to go ahead and review the Matthew, um, Matthew story of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star to the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and legal expert, experts and asked them where the Christ was, going, was born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you the least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went. And look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. So thank you all for, for joining us in sort of that reflection. So the next thing we're going to do is that we're going to just sort of give us some nice context for our, um, for our 
for our learning and for our participatory um, experience. Um, so Matthew is going to go ahead and take over and we're going to go ahead and launch into putting the context around Epiphany. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. And that reading, so beautiful. Uh, the last line has a, a near and dear place in my heart. Uh, the Magi, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, left for their own country by another route. Um, because that was always the last line of the Christmas pageant for me growing up. And um, so it, it, you know, then we would all sing, go tell it on the mountain. Uh, but, but that passage, they left for their own country by another road. You know, it has a double meaning. Um, the Magi have been changed. Something has happened to them and they leave in a different way than they arrived. Um, so what's happened to them? And, that, and that's why Epiphany is so important. Um, the Christ child has been revealed to them. And if we really look at the theme of Epiphany, um, and we're going to be talking mostly about the Magi today, and here's this beautiful image from a Roman sarcophagus in the fourth century. How extraordinary is that? Um, got the Magi pointing at a star, and then the Christ child kind of reaching out. I'll take that. The broader theme of Epiphany, though, is all about revelation. It's about the Christ child. It's about Jesus Christ being revealed. And I think in that collect earlier, it used the word manifest, which same idea, uh, Christ being manifest and revealed to the world. And so as the season of Epiphany goes on, the lectionary actually does a phenomenal job of giving us readings that all follow this theme of Jesus being revealed or showcased to the world. Um, I used to say uh, when I preach on Epiphany that Epiphany is like Jesus's coming out party. Mm -hmm. um, I know some, uh, some of our folks from, um, from different parts of the country may be familiar with debutante balls. It might be sort of silly to think of Jesus uh, having a coming out ball, but, but Epiphany is it. The first Sunday after the Epiphany is always the baptism of our Lord, and the reading that we get is always a baptism story. And so how is that revelation? Well, the revelation, of course, comes when the voice from heaven cries out, uh, this is my son, my beloved, with him I am well pleased. And so as Jesus is baptized, suddenly he is revealed as um, not just, you know, another person being baptized by John, but as a beloved, as the son of God. The readings uh, kind of go forward, and depending on le what lectionary year we're in, we get different readings. Um, but this past year, it was the wedding at Cana, uh, which was one of the Epiphany readings. And what a cool thing. It's the first miracle. And uh, it's that first moment where the people and Jesus's mother as well realize, okay, uh, there's some power here. And so Jesus's power and his um, ability to, to make abundance out of scarcity is revealed. Uh, some other kind of classic epiphany readings are Jesus's first preaching at the synagogue in Nazareth, uh, the calling of the disciples. This year we're going to get the uh, Sermon on the Mount as some of the epiphany readings coming up in this, this epiphany, and that's really Jesus's first extended teaching series, and so that makes sense for Jesus to be revealed as teacher. And then what's neat is uh, the last Sunday of Epiphany is always the Transfiguration reading. And we read it from different Gospels. Um, but again, if you're looking for a, a Revelation reading, this is it. Uh, two of the disciples walk up a mountain with Jesus. They think they're just taking a hiking trip. And then all of a sudden, he is transfigured before their eyes. His face shines and his clothes are dazzling white and all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are there. And then once again, a voice from heaven comes. This is my son, my beloved. Um, and then it says, listen to him is, is the last line of, uh, of the transfiguration reading. So uh, for the disciples, um, this miracle worker, this teacher, this one who was sort of shown as something special at the baptism is, is now fully revealed as, um, as son of God. We might even say second person of the Trinity. Um, again, coming back to this idea that, that epiphany is all about revelation. If we bring it all the way back to the Magi then, we've uh, got Mary and the Christ child and the Magi again. The, the trick then I think uh, for helping ourselves as, as leaders understand Epiphany and then um, helping those in our small groups or our families or our congregations understand the Magi story is that, you know, the gifts are important um, and symbolic, 
but it's what is given to the Magi themselves that is equally important, if not more important. Um, the gift that the Magi received is the revelation of Christ. So the stories of our faith, including our own stories, enrich and deepen our relationship to God and to Jesus. This simple tale about wise men from afar who followed a star to seek Jesus has several layers of meaning, as Matthew has noted already. But perhaps the most important is how the incarnation of Jesus was shared and made known to the world. From that moment on, people of all colors, of all cultures, and all places have been invited to be a part of this story. But what about those gifts they carried? The Magi carried three gifts. We don't know how many Magi there were, but there were certainly three gifts. They are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we know biblical archaeology tells us that those are standard gifts for the time for people in power. They were valuable, and they had a significant meaning to them. Gold was for kingship, the symbol that we still use in our crowns today. Frankincense is an incense. We still use it in churches. And it's a symbol of a deity. If we, if we think of incense rising, we think of our prayers rising, leaving where we are and traveling to where God is. So Hebrews used frankincense, incense, as a sacrifice, as an offering to God, a visible manifestation of their offering. And the third gift is myrrh, which in my favorite Christmas carol, um, what child is this, is this terrible, deep, dark, brooding piece, this gift, because it was used to prepare bodies after death. It was an, an anointing oil to show the family and the people of the dead that that body was cared for and was meaningful. So valuable gifts, important throughout the culture of that area at that time. But they have meaning for us today. I, I think I'm an educator because I think that symbols have meanings. Um, I, they, it's more than an image, it represents something. Um, and so knowing what the gifts are, what their symbols represent, helps us to teach more about the Magi and helps us to remember that the gift of revelation is important now. When we set up our crushes, when we talk about the Magi in Sunday school, we can include the meanings of the gifts, not simply reflecting our own desire to normalize Santa Claus, but to reflect the greater symbology of the gifts and of who Jesus was to the world at his time and to the world today. The birth of Jesus is something special. The gifts are something special. The birth of Jesus is something special. And the gifts point us outward from the moment in time of the nativity into today, and they indicate a new season. Can we pull up the liturgical calendar? Yes, of course. So that new season, the, day, the Feast of the Epiphany is one day, and the new season is the season of Epiphany. And again, with symbol, I love the symbol of the liturgical calendar. This is Jennifer Gamber's liturgical calendar for this year. And it's a wheel. You might be familiar with this calendar if you practice godly play with your families in your church. Um, the wheel helps us recognize that this is a different type of time. It's a different type of calendar. It's God's time, Kairos. And we travel this calendar, this wheel every year starting with Advent at the top, the beginning of our year, and going all the way around. And those green weeks of Epiphany, the green growing time, we see where, God, where Jesus is at work in the world, and it helps us to remember to look and see where we're at work in the world, doing Jesus' work, our hands and our feet. And then it helps us prepare for the next season as we move in 
further into the story and further into our own understanding of the story. So those gifts carry us through. And this um, uh, liturgical wheel is courtesy of Jennifer Gamber. And so I'm going to go ahead in the chat box, um, share that, that link. So that way everyone has the advantage of, um, of finding it. So I'm gonna go ahead and send it out to everyone. Um, while we're sort of transitioning here, um, go ahead and chat with any questions that you have. I see that we have um, quite a few people who came in since we did our introductions. So again, I'm Sarah Stonecipher. I'm the digital missioner at Center for the Ministry of Teaching. And I'm joined by my colleagues um, and Building Faith co-editors, Matthew Hugoslowski, Charlotte Hangreese, and, and then my, um, my fellow CMT instructor and um, curriculum guru, Dorothy Lithicum. And I did just chat out this wonderful, um, the wonderful calendar that Jennifer Gamber um, creates every year um, for us to sort of keep track of liturgical time. Does anybody have any questions at this point of, of transition? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and launch into um, our more practical end of of this uh, of this um, of our of our webinar, and that is sort of what you you can do in all of our different faith communities, and what we can do in all of our various faith communities in order to make this feast day an intergenerational formation experience. Um, and so I'm glad that we were able to do some reflecting um, on our on our on our on our journey about going into Advent. Sort of what Advent can or sorry, not into Advent. Clearly, I'm excited for Advent rather than for Epiphany right now. Um, heading into Epiphany, um, sort of learning the backstory, reminding ourselves of what the backstory is of Epiphany, and then um, getting ready um, to to go into um, go into this feast day. So I'm gonna go ahead and share um, my screen after I, um, I give you another good um, website that I'm gonna be talking about. So one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite, I think it really is a tradition for my parish is the Epiphany House Blessing. Um, that does involve, it sort of allows us to invoke the three wise men um, and and their and their journey of of coming to go coming to see Jesus. So so that way they um, so then that way they are paying homage. And so you can see two examples up on the screen here. One from 2008, and then one. This is actually the one on the right hand side with the brick is actually from um, from Virginia Theological Seminary last year. And so you can see that the the year is sort of interjected by CMB, which is um, which is the which is the shorthand for the three um, magi, the three wise men that visited. Um, but it also um, it also is a representation of a blessing, a household blessing. And so, um, so what I love about this is that it can be it's something that families, that couples, that households can bring into the home, but it, then it ties back to this epiphany story. And so um, many, many parishes have done this before. And the way that I like, the way that I like the most is where there is a little, um, uh, you can see here, this is what it would look like for this next year. So 20 CMB and then 17. Um, but I, what I love is that, you know, you do this blessing of the chalk um, and, and I, and I love the idea of putting this within worship. So, so then that way you can, um, call on the saints, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. So then that way you together as a community are blessing this chalk. And then it provides the foundation and it provides the words to go forth into the household and allow people to gather in their homes and sort of place this blessing, this physical manifestation of God in, in our households. 
<clears throat> Sarah, can I jump in and, and yeah. give a suggestion of how folks can do it? Yeah, so, sure. Um, the kind of flow of it when you're with your friends or family, whoever's kind of doing the, the chalking of the door or the house blessing is um, that you sort of say um, 2017 years ago, you know, and so then somebody writes the 20 mm -hmm. and, and then somebody the writes the 17 and depending on how many people you have, you could pass the chalk, you know, from one to the other. But uh, so 2017 years ago, Caspar, Melchior and Balthazar, you know, visited the Christ child. Um, and then, you know, you say, um, peace be upon this house. And then you give the chalk to, you know, maybe one of the, the younger people um, and they can do the crosses in between each one. Yes. So, you know, for, of course, if you have um, kids who can make their letters, that's great practice for them. But if you have kids who can just make lines, then they can do the crosses. Yeah, and so I have the I have the text up on the up on the screen now, and we'll, we're going to be reposting this um, within the YouTube comments as well, and um, we'll make sure that we we repost this on Building Faith um, as as Epiphany um, gets even closer. Um, but I but I love this idea is that you're transporting the blessings of the church community into your home, and then it gives everyone an opportunity to sort of gather and you know, set out your intention for the entire year and also to, to bless this house, to bless, you know, your protection. And again, the, and the last and final blessing is, you know, God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. You know, Christ, God's incarnation is present in the love and care we manifest to each other in our ordinary daily lives together. Like our ordinary daily lives together, that's so powerful. Um... All right, so I think that um, Dorothy is going to go ahead and share the, um, the amazing opportunity that churches have um, sort of in that weird post-Christmas, pre-going back to school time, <laughs> what they can do in order to have some faith formation there. Well, my colleagues will tell you that I am the official Vacation Bible School cheerleader for this whole area. I believe in it so powerfully because it gives us a chance to do three things that I think are critical. One is it showers love on every single participant from the youngest to the oldest. Secondly, it gives our young people from middle school through high school a chance to show what they can do in leadership roles. And finally, it, it lets everyone learn a Bible story inside and out. So what does Bible school have to do with epiphany? Well, a church in North Carolina. Oop, Dorothy, I think we lost. Carolina. Oh, it comes. Dorothy, I think we lost. Yes. So can you go ahead and say where it was again? It was in uh, Church of the Good Shepherd in Asheboro, North Carolina. All right. And I have the Episcopal Teacher article up now that we will also be linking to as well. And that will give you some more details of this project that they did. But they offered a three-day vacation Bible school-like experience for the children in their community centered on Epiphany. So... <clears throat> What they did was they set aside three days. I think I don't think they were all right in a row, but as participants arrived every day, they began to work on the scenery. So if a parent needed to drop off a child early, there wasn't a problem because there was something to do, but the child who arrived later didn't miss anything. So on the first day, the theme was about call. So the activities and the snacks and everything was about the call and how the wise men were called to leave their comfortable homes and go to this strange land. The craft has to do with making prayer beads or gratitude beads, and at snack time, children decorated cookies. And then on Monday, they also assigned the roles for a pageant that they were preparing for to do the next Sunday on when they, their church celebrated the Feast of the Epiphany. Nice. On day two, the focus was on worship, recognizing that through worship, 
we give it, it gives us a way to thank God, to give God praise, and to be together as we are, are as we worship this God together. Uh, there's a special craft that has to do with the um, scent of, of smell, which goes back as Charlotte talked about the gifts of the wise men. And we focus on aromas that day and ask the children to think about the smells that they have smelled that give them good memories of places and times, whether it's the smell of coconut from the beach or the smell of the fur from Christmas trees. The craft activity that's offered that day can also be an outreach um, exercise for the children, which is another good thing. And during the second day, we also make, begin to make the props for, all, for the pageant. And here you see, for example, the children in, at, in Asheboro made this wonderful globe. Um, I'm not sure exactly what country that is, but <laughs> it, it's obviously, it is obviously our world. And then the final day, uh, the, the whole focus is on mission. And like the Magi, we are to carry the message of Jesus Christ out into the world. Um, and light is the theme of the craft for the day and also for the snack. And they're suggesting that if there's a kitchen available, the children might even want to make uh, king's cakes for the, uh, for the people in their church for that next Sunday. On the Sunday, the actual pageant is presented and it becomes, I think, a part of a tradition that many churches will not want to let, let, let go of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, our suggestion is that if you have this winter program, it's a good way to capture a time that some people are sad about the passing of Christmas, unsure what to do with children out of school. It gives us all the time to come together and celebrate the birth and the revelation of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Mm -hmm. So Charlotte, tell us more about King's Cakes. What, exactly. One of the um, one of the um, one of the things that Dorothy just mentioned as a possible activity during Epiphany VBS was to make King's Cake. Um, I grew up outside of Boston. And I spent have spent significant time on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi, and there are king cakes in both of those places, which I think is really neat. In Boston, um, they are Gayette de Roi, they're French, and in the Gulf Coast, they are definitely king cake. <laughs> is very distinct. Um, the tradition predates Christianity. It is um, a waning of the year celebration. It's particularly in French, in France, and in Spain, and then spreading out to where those countries colonized. In the Gulf Coast, that tradition was brought to the Gulf Coast by Monsieur Diagreville. In Mississippi, we call it Diagreville, um, but the cake is actually Spanish in origin, in, in, in Mississippi at least. There's a, there's a more um, European version, Galette de Roi. Um, <laughs> Very pretty. Um, Sarah, can you go back to the other one? Of course. So this is a traditional Southern, Southern King cake. It has three colors of sprinkles on top. They represent the three gifts of the Magi. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a very, very buttery, eggy cake. It's a brioche. And sometimes it's filled, sometimes it's not, usually with sugar. All of those things are celebrated with abundance. Um, if you know anything about the, the Gulf Coast and New Orleans, you know that that's the season of Carnival from Epiphany through Mardi Gras. And these cakes celebrate everything that is good and rich. So we need to eat them up. The king cake often has a baby inside, although now if you buy them, the baby will be outside so that you can put it in yourself. Um, the original cakes had a fava bean in them. So in France, sometimes they're called le fave. Um, and the idea is that on the Feast of the Epiphany, the person who's hosting a party presents the cake and the cake is cut and the pieces are eaten and the person who gets the baby or the bean or the coin is then required to provide the next cake. 
And I like this as a seasonal activity because it focuses on the feast itself and then it carries it through for the whole season. And I think, I think if, you have, if you work in a congregation, this would work with youth group. You could do it as a youth group activity. You could do it um, if you worked in a school, my son's preschool, all through the season, the child who got the bean on Friday had to bring the cake in for the next Friday. Um, that may be a little bit too much cake. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but to sort of push that mission outwards rather, just, rather than just focusing on partying, um, in Mexico, the cake tradition, or this in Spain, and then thus in Mexico, the cake tradition, if you get the bean or the baby, you have to go to church at the presentation of the infant for the baptism. And so it brings you back into the church family. All sorts of ideas. I'd love to hear ideas if you, if you use a king cake in formation in your congregation. I think it would be neat to see how people use it more for formation and less for good eats. Well, well, I think there's a, a teaching point to, to really tie in there that, you know, Christ is born as a baby. Um, but if nobody ever found him, he just, you know, so it's first the shepherds, these lowly shepherds that find him. Uh, of course, Mary and Joseph find him. But then, you know, as we read the gospel story, the, the circle, the concentric circles of of Jesus being revealed get bigger and bigger. So then the Magi find him and then the disciples find him or he finds the disciples. But yeah, I mean, the teaching point, if you were working with children or youth is to say, um, it's all about finding Jesus and Jesus revealing himself to the world because if, if we never would have found him, you, you know. And, I, and I, I, I grew up with King Cake as part of Mardi Gras, and it wasn't until um, I was working at a Catholic school where they did um, King Cake as part of Epiphany. And I have to say, like, the, the parallels and sort of the, the bookends and, you know, setting off one season and then sort of ending another and then starting of another church of a, of a Lenten season, I think is like, it's a wonderful reminder um, sort of about, you know, Jesus's designation and, you know, different ways that, you know, people, that he, he appeared to people and people perceived him. And I'm in Charlotte found this um, great article um, about, is that, she said, is that a plastic baby Jesus in my cake from NPR that sort of explains a little bit of a different tongue in cheek way of explaining the traditions. I'm, I'm, I just chatted that out to everybody. Thank you. Of course. So if, um, if king cakes aren't quite your thing, um, or maybe one king cake is too many king cakes for you, another activity or way to carry the Feast of the Epiphany through the season of Epiphany, and in fact through your whole calendar, is an activity that was created by Pastor Tracy Smith in her book, Seamless Faith. Tracy is a Presbyterian pastor. She has very small boys and lives in San Antonio. And Seamless, Seamless Faith um, is a book that specifically ties activities in our worship in church to the home. Um, building, building stronger children, stronger families through practicing faith at home. And this idea is for stars. Um, in recent years, oh, uh, Charlotte, they're guiding, they're guiding word for the whole season, everything. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte, we seem to have lost you. Can you just say that one sentence one more time? Sure. Um, so this idea comes from, from having a word that guides your whole life, mm -hmm. your daily living. Um, and, and in this activity, which is geared towards older children and youth, and depending on your group, and the person who's organizing the activity cuts out stars and writes one word on each star and then puts them in a big basket. And the night of Epiphany, every person in the household, or if you're using it with a youth group or a church or a family worship service, everyone chooses one star. And that is the, the word on that star is 
where they're going to focus for the whole year or if you don't have that long of an attention span for the epiphany. Um, and this article that is on your screen now um, will be linked and it has the whole process and program um, ways to, to think about what you might do with those words um, and even ways to tie it into the next year and the following season of epiphany. Yeah, and I think this is a great activity for um, youth and teenagers. Um, you know, sometimes a lot of the activities we have um, are great for young children or children, but this one really um, scales all the way through um, for teenagers to, to pick a word, uh, to really put a little bit of thought into it. Um, you know, a word like perseverance or, um, well, patience is up on, you know, um, to claim it and own it and to think of supporting each other as a family through the season of Epiphany and make that your, your guiding star for the year. Uh, and that's terrific. And we have a few good comments. Um, so Lynn says, our parish blessed and distributed chalk last year. Every so, so often I enter my home and my eyes are drawn up in the markings over my door and I am blessed all over again. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. I believe that some of the markings around campus are also still available too. And so you can walk into any doorway and know that the home has been blessed during Epiphany. I think there was also another suggestion um, that apparently there have been some communities that place additional figures within the king cake and then, oh, it's a, oh, so it's sort of like a scavenger hunt or the M&M's game as part of youth ministry, where if you get a different, a different figure, you have to answer a different question. <laughs> so like, where has God appeared to you? Who do you trust and follow? Where do you good, see the good news in the world? So, oh, wonderful. Oh, so Deborah said that she did the, um, the STAR activity with her adult class, and they received a random word, and there have been some amazing epiphanies that occurred during the year. I, I love it when epiphany is, is beyond January 6th. So that's a, great, that's a great idea to do that with your maybe adult Bible study or even as part of your adult forum um, during the epiphany season. That's a great, great suggestion, Deborah. So, oh, any other? Any does anybody else have any suggestions on how they have um, how they have have previously celebrated Epiphany as part of their faith communities or even in their home? You can chat it just to the panelists or to or to everyone, whatever you feel comfortable with. And I'm also going to share um, the. So I shared everything I need to. Just kidding. <laughs> So while, uh, while people are chiming in, um, I have two more ideas. Ooh. And um, now for readers of Building Faith, these uh, may not be new ideas. They're sort of Building Faith ideas. Oh, and then Lisa Brown has one coming up. Oh, awesome. Uh, but let me say my two. Uh, so going with this theme of Revelation, um, to take dry erase markers and uh, write scripture verses or encouraging um, spiritual religious encouragements mm -hmm. on uh, mirrors in the house. That's kind of a fun thing that a kid or a teenager wakes up and all of a sudden there's been revealed to them um, a message on their mirror. Um, and what's great is you dry erase markers, you can change it every day. That's and then uh, another thing to do during Epiphany is to refocus on baptism. Um, the Feast of the Baptism of Our Lord, like I said before, is the first Sunday of Epiphany. So if you have that baptism candle, if your church tradition has the tradition of giving a, a candle at baptism, or maybe if uh, your child received a Bible or a baptism certificate, Epiphany, um, you know, as the rush of Christmas and everything is over, is a great time of the year to find that, like find that candle, find that Bible, find that baptism certificate, and, um, and do something with it. Um, you could frame it or put it in a safe place. You could make a little faith chest. Um, I don't particularly like making boxes, so I buy uh, like a wooden box uh, that would fit the candle, and, and you can find um, those on Building Faith, uh, the links, um, or just go to you know, Michael's or Amazon. 
Um, so to find the baptism candle, to you know, remind everybody how important baptism is during the season of Epiphany and um, to make that a, a household opportunity. That's awesome. I know um, I've also seen during Christmas, so pre, post Christmas, pre um, Epiphany during the season of Christmas, where the wise people, wise men, and their various things slowly start to come closer um, towards the crush. And that, of course, like works best like in you know, a tiny household. But sometimes it works when, um, <laughs> when, you're, when you have people who are participating as part, um, as part of the church service as well. So that is really awesome. Um, okay. Can I read the Lisa Brown ideas? Yes, that would be great. And I think I know what she's talking about. So Lisa Brown says they have an epiphany photo booth at church. And what this is, is they set up a digital camera in like the corner of the church or make, you know, some curtains around it to make it a photo booth. And then they have a bunch of gear and props, like a robe and a hat and um, funny things and crowns um, that people can put on and then take a picture. Um, it's just kind of fun, but it helps... Uh, you know, capture the story of the Magi and then they take pictures and then you can share them on social media, you know, people pretending to be the Magi. Yeah. And then um, the sparkler procession, I'm sure she could say more about that, but um, you know, follow the star, let your light shine and, um, and do a sparkler procession into church. Um, I have to, I didn't realize that I had so many um, stories about Epiphany uh, until we started planning um, we started um, planning this uh, this webinar, I have to say. Um, but I think that these, these are all wonderful. And I think Epiphany is a, a, just a great time to sort of refocus um, on Jesus and sort of what what else we're, we're asking of, of our faith community in order, to, um, in order to put themselves out into the world as followers of Christ. So, um, so we want to continue and to have you um, share with us as you guys have already started, um, uh, as you guys have already started to do, to make sure that that we know what you're doing, and so in that way we can continue to gather all of our wonderful, um, our wonderful ideas, um, and, and making sure. And we'll we, we'll attribute them. Don't worry. So we want to hear from you, and 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 make sure that you are keeping us in your thoughts, just like. Um, that you are in ours, and we hope that you know that, is that one of the goals of the Center for the Ministry of Teaching is to make sure that our faith leaders are equipped to go out and do their jobs. And this is one of the reasons why we started this webinar. Um, so as our, as our last moment of epiphany, we're going to go ahead and um, say this wonderful poem from um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Matthew, can you read it for us since it was your favorite? Yes, and I think you found the poem, Sarah, and it was part of a larger poem. And then these were the last two stanzas um, from the early 1900s, I think. Then why should we in silence be when nature lends her voice to praises, when heaven and earth proclaim the truth of him for whom that lone star blazes? No, be not still. But with a will, strike all your harps and set them ringing. On hill and heath, let every breath throw all its power into singing. Mm. Beautiful. Wonderful. Such good imagery about stars and night and guiding. So, so thank you all so much for joining us for our first um, uh, our first webinar, our first Wisdom from the Fields webinar. We want to make sure that you know that we are here for you, and we're going to continue this conversation about Epiphany and how we celebrate the Feast of Epiphany um, over on the Center for the Ministry of Teaching Facebook page. And again, if you want to share this webinar, or share our good ideas, or you know maybe sort of spin spin off of some of the ideas that we've shared for your own faith congregation, the recorded webinar will be available on Friday, and will include all of the different links that were that was sent out that were sent out, um, and sort of some other some other show notes as well. Um, and so um, 
so we want to um, sort of uh, sort of acknowledge that and sort of and thank Matthew and Charlotte and Joy and Dorothy for sharing their wonderful wisdom and years of experience with all of us. Um, and then I want to give you a nice preview for our next webinar, which will be on um, December 14th. So it's around the same time, middle of the month at 3 p.m. And that will be um, Digital Stewardship Churches and Online Giving with Kyle Oliver and Carolyn Chilton. So please mark your calendars, um, join me on December 14th, and I will go ahead and chat out um, that link so then that way everyone can have that ready to go. Um, and just, you know, give a little clap of virtual clap, maybe even, you know, some, um, some spirit fingers, um, or, you know, good juju to our three awesome, um, webinar participants. And thank all of you for joining us for our first, um, Wisdom from the Fields webinar. It was wonderful to have all of you here, and we hope that um, that you are starting off your Thanksgiving festivities in good time and getting yourselves prepared for Advent and for Christmas, and more importantly, for Epiphany. So thank you. Thank you all. Please give us any feedback, and we look forward to hearing and learning from you soon. Bye. Bye.